Roland, uh, I'd love to give it over to you, but I need to take care for a couple of housekeeping items. So this is uh, supposedly a very interactive webinar. Um, like um, you guys are totally free to uh, ask questions. We have a chat window that you can use throughout the complete event, and I will do my very best to catch up with all questions coming up. We also have a Q&A section uh, to the bottom right of your screen, somewhere there, where you can also put in your questions whenever you have some. This session is going to be recorded, um, and you can um, take a look at the recording afterwards. Whenever it's published, I hope it's only going to take a couple of days. Uh, as you have noticed, there's no sign-up requirements, so we can't let you know that the recording is online, um, so it's up to you to check back in frequently with the Developer Webinar Series website. Uh, did I forgot anything? I don't think so. So, Roland, um, thanks for being here. It's always a pleasure to see you presenting, so I'm very much looking forward to it. Take yeah, away. thank you, Marcus. Thanks a lot. So, yeah, let's get started. So, today we are talking about Knative, and uh, it's Knative itself, it's a Kubernetes-based platform for modern event-driven serverless workloads. So, this is, this is quite a mouthful. And before we jump into right into Knative, let's talk a little bit about serverless, because if you ask 10 people about serverless, you probably get 10 different answers what serverless is. And so I picked more or less randomly a definition. This one is from the CNCF. And uh, yeah, this is a quite lengthy definition, and I highlighted the parts which are relevant for Knative and grayed out a little bit those parts which are not so relevant for Knative itself. So, but let, let's focus on the important part. So, serverless in the context of Knative, it's about applications that are, do not require any active server management. So, you're just deploying your applications, which are packaged in a container, and then Knative will manage that for you. And it's a deployment model. This is important because it's not a programming model. So, you can put anything what you want into your container. This is a little bit different to FAS, functions or services, or functions which are more also implicate the programming model. And with Knative, you are executing. So, with, you are really focused on the demand of your application, so on the number of requests your application gets. And those are executed, scaled, and built really corresponding to the demand. So, actually, when there is no demand, then you don't have to pay anything because then your application is not running. Okay, this is a very brief that We'll see more of that in detail later on. Uh, yeah, here that guy, of course, is a, it's a kind of a joke about that. So, what's the difference of serverless with CGI? And this is actually more, uh, yeah, poking on the the fact that really serverless is a quite a fuzzy word, which is not very has no clear boundaries. So, yeah, maybe you can convince him what, why it's not really only CGI. So, Kenneth is, is uh, for sure a little bit more than CGI. Okay, this is what about, I started my programming career with. It's like yeah, the old exactly. Perl scripts, right? So. And That's they true. tend to be very function-oriented, so I, I think to a certain extent it is a good comparison. Yeah, but actually it's always uh, focused on a single machine, so this is, I think this is the, the main difference between the old, good old CGI bins from there, from the time there. So yeah, Fair. but actually you're completely right, so it's really something you you throw a, a code over, over the fence and then somebody is running it, and this is a little bit like the CGI bins, right? Okay. But let's continue with Knative now. Now, uh, what is Knative? So let's uh, go to the definition, how Knative defines itself. So Knative, Knative is a Kubernetes-based platform to deploy and manage modern serverless workloads. So it's really about deploying and managing stuff. And uh, it contains two components. These are really the kind of pillars of, on which Knative is built upon. So it's serving and eventing. The serving part is all about a request-driven model that serves the container with your application and can also scale to zero, which means you can, can scale down so that no pod or container is running for you. And when the first request comes in from the outside, then Knative will spin up the pod for you and serve the request. The other part is about eventing, and Matthias will talk about this later on. And um, it's about the common infrastructure for consuming and producing events that will stimulate your Knative services or applications. So the one thing is about really serving your application, and the other part is about how to connect this to the outside world. We are eventing. 
let's uh, have some look at some background information. So where is Knative coming from? So Knative has been started mid 2018 by Google as an open source project. So it has been started from scratch and contains a lot of experiences that Google has gained over the time with, uh, with operating serverless applications. It's community driven and but has also a lot of vendor backing. So uh, actually there are quite some companies uh, which, uh, which are involved in the in this project, so of course Google is the initiator, but also Red Hat is one uh, a big contributor to Knative, IBM, VMware, Trigger Mesh, SAP, and many more. Community-wise, it's organi organized in multiple working groups, which uh, with, have uh, weekly meetings. And uh, you find here the, the, the link to the Knative Dev and also the GitHub ar archive, and you find all of this uh, on these pages, a lot of documentation, also examples. We are currently at release uh, 0.14, and uh, Knative has a six-week release cadence, which means you get every six weeks a new release from Knative. Good. Then let's. Uh, how could you try yourself, Knative? Of course, this is one of our very important questions because um, it's quite easy to set up. So you can use it directly on given Kubernetes cluster. You can use any Kubernetes cluster if you like. Um, you find the installation documentation on the Knative Dev website as well. But you can also use a hosted version of Knative. And uh, there are two prominent offerings which you can use. One is called Google Cloud Run. This is running, this is funny because it's not really running on Kubernetes, it's running on App Engine. And um, you can Try it out. There's a free tier you can try, but it's important to know that not all Knative features are implemented out of the box. For example, you cannot use config maps for the configuration and other stuff. This is this is due to the nature that Google Cloud Run is based on App Engine. Hey, if you uh, want, Roland, yeah, is uh, there a way to try out OpenShift serverless on code ready containers? Do you know that? Yeah, you can try that out as well. So OpenShift, um, so you see OpenShift serverless with the offering from Red Hat. You can directly install it from Operator Hub, and this is also included in Code Ready containers. So you can try this also on your local machine if you like to. But you, of course, you can use any OpenShift uh, OpenShift cluster and install the product. And I have this is a good question because I can show you how this looks like on from the OpenShift console. So you see, uh, it's the an OpenShift 4.3 cluster here, which you can use. And you, you if you know OpenShift, you also probably familiar, familiar with the operator hub. And then uh, this is the more or less breaking news because uh, we released the OpenShift serverless operator here. Uh, I think one week ago, Matthias, I think it was one week ago, right? The GA. So uh, you can start it directly from the operator hub. And uh, then you have, have this uh, operator running here. You can have a look on the installed operator, and as soon as this operator is running, it takes care of everything what you need to operate a Knative installation. And now I could, and we are using this cluster now in the demo later on, where you can create your Knative services right here. So this is very easy so to set up. So if you're an OpenShift uh, user, this is really the perfect way to how to try it. And the good thing, of course, as uh, OpenShift serverless is based fully on vanilla Knative. There are only the, the operators uh, which has been wrapped around a Knative installation. You can uh, benefit from all Knative features which are included. OK. So now we know, we know a little bit about Knative. We know how we can try out Knative. And uh, now let's jump onto serving, the serving part. What is Knative serving all about? It's all about routing getting to zero and tracking revision history. What does uh, this mean? So it's about that you can scale to zero. I already mentioned that. It's demand-based, so it's not based on CPU or memory usage, but really on the number of concurrent requests coming in. So it's really kind of really connects to a kind of a business matrix. It separates very clearly the code and the configuration. 
but Gnative is not suited for every application. So it's only really suitable for stateless applications, which um, have some restrictions. This is due to, uh, to the fact that you really need a flexible way to scaling to zero and scaling up. And so what you need to do if you have a stateful application, you need to try to move out the state outside of your application, for example, into a database or also with, uh, with the browser which comes in with, with some cookies or something like that. So this is an important restriction which you need to know. Then uh, it also has a rich traffic split up to capabilities which allows you to model a lot of uh, different custom rollout strategies of new versions. You can easily create your own blue-green deployments or canary deployments with this traffic split capabilities. We will see an example later in the demo as well. So let uh, the resources, so this is something, so Knative itself is on, runs on top of Kubernetes and uh, this platform is um, contains several so-called custom resource definitions or CRDs, which is an the way how you can extend Kubernetes by adding new types to the system. The important types here, is, so and the most important type here is the service, which is the user-facing type. So if you interact with Knative, you always use the service. And um, as soon as you create a service, then a route and a configuration object are created on uh, uh, on behalf of your service. So it's really a one-to-one -one relationship between a configuration and a route uh, and the service and the route in the service. And any time you change the configuration of a service, then the configuration is updated and a new revision is created reflecting the state of your configuration at the time. So with this mechanism, you can build up a complete history of your configuration, which uh, allows you to do nice things like, for example, you can have uh, a version reflecting your version 1 of your application because it contains the reference to your container image in version 1. But you also can have uh, then a revision which points to the version 2 of your application. And then you can create a route which makes a kind of a traffic split and which distributes the traffic among these two revisions. Okay, so these are the basic objects, and actually this, this is all what Canadian Serving is about. And also, the, uh, what, why is uh, this model so appealing for developers? Because it makes things also simpler. It's not only about auto-scaling, but you can also very easily create your application and deploy your application. What you see here now is uh, a deployment. If you know Kubernetes or OpenShift, you know that uh, how a deployment looks like. A deployment has a very lengthy specification here. and um, if you compare the corresponding kind of service, you see that it has a different API version, a different kind, and uh, a, a lot of things has been left out. So, for example, the, everything which is uh, in gray here is not needed on Knative service, so it's just here to, to, to show the difference to the deployment. And it's much, much e easier, simpler, and but more importantly, it not only creates your deployment for you, but also the Kubernetes service, so, and, and the ingress or route object, which uh, also created on behalf of you. So if you deploy a Kubernetes service, then a deployment is created for you, a Kubernetes service is created for you, and an ingress and route is uh, created for you. Yeah, here we also see that a little bit of problem with the naming, because you see here service and K service in the top of in the title. And this is a little bit unfortunate that uh, Kubernetes also has chosen service as the name of its uh, entity because there is already a Kubernetes service, but both of those are totally different things. So one is really, yeah, so this is uh, important to keep in mind. Okay, so I have a little bit, um, now a, a short demo, five minutes or so, and uh, we will see that in action. Let me jump to the terminal. So what I have here is now, I have my terminal, I have a connection to the cluster that you just have seen. And uh, in the top of half of the screen, you see a watch on the pods. So you see all the pods that are created in my namespace. And what I'm going to show you to now in this demo is also the Knative client tool, which is called KN. You can download that from the Knative website. You can use Brew if you're running on macOS. So there's uh, several ways how you can install that. And all what this tool really does, it creates the custom resources for you and then deploys it to the cluster later in the eventing part, but here we'll show you how to do this with direct with this, with the deployment descriptors, with direct with YAML. But for us, uh, we are just uh, 
using KN and uh, let, uh, let's create a, um, a simple creative service. So you, you give it a name, it's called random here, and the only mandatory option which you have to provide is the pointer to the container image. So I'm using here a REST service, which I call random, and it's a very simple REST service, which is based on Quarkus, and um, which returns to you just a random number. Okay, let's do that. In the top, you will see now, um, now that there's a, a pod is created for you. This is your application. So the first time you deploy a scanative service, the pod is directly created for you. And here you see a little bit is also going synchronously. And at the end, you get uh, you get the, the access URL. So I can't just use that. And uh, I use JQ to make it a little bit nicer. And you see what, what comes back is here really the just a REST response with the version and the random number. And if I call it a second time, you get another random number. OK, and if I'm, if I'm continue talking, you will see that uh, because I do not send any traffic on this uh, image, that it will scale down to zero easily um, soon. So you can look into the, the service uh, describe. And you can service describe is uh, something where you can get a presentation of your service, you can look at it. You also can export it into JAML, so you can easily also see how it looks like behind the scenes. Here you see uh, it's really quite quite shortish, so if you compare this to a full deployment, it's very really a little bit more dense. And also, I'm to the top, you can also look at the revisions, and as you have just created the service, you see here that there is a one revision there, first generation, gets all the traffic here. This is important. And uh, yeah. Now, if you look at the top now, you see now, because I've talked so much, so I talk, took, uh, talk longer than one minute, this is the default value. Then the pod scales down to zero. So if there are uh, no requests within one minute, it scales down, it, uh, your candidate service has no pods running anymore. OK, let's make an update. Uh, Update random. What I'm doing here now is I'm next that I'm showing you the parallel concurrency. So I I'm, can update a service. I set a concurrency limit at ten. This means as soon as a pod gets more than ten requests at a time, then Canadian service scales up the number of pods. So you see this in action in a second. I'm also scale, uh, changing this auto scale window of sixty seconds to six seconds, which means that it will scale down after six seconds when no request comes in. And I'm introducing an artificial delay of one second or a thousand milliseconds so that I can simulate some kind of work on the cluster. Let me do that. And yeah, you see it's again the container is created. And uh, the next step is I'm using Hey, which is a little small command line tool to make some kind of simple workload testing. I'm using with minus C50, 50 concurrent requests. Um, and this a thousand times directly to my service here. I'm starting that. We'll make it a little bit, little bit larger. And now you see that more and more containers are created. So they, they are running here now, uh, processing the requests. And um, you see also that there are more than five. So actually, I would expect five uh, containers because I have 50 and I have 10 concurrent requests. So in order to have 50 parallel requests served by, by that pod, there, of course, is five. But a little bit more because Canadian decides to already scale up earlier before it gets the full utilization. So it's always it's below 100%. It's a, typically it's around 70%, but you can tune this percentage as well. Okay, and now after six seconds, you see again that all your pods are really scaling down to zero and everything is gone. Afterwards. Okay, I have a final example which is about how you can make a rollout. So if you look again at the revision list of our service, we see now that we have two revisions. So one is our initial revision, this one, and then I changed some parameters and I get a second snapshot of the configuration of the second revision. So 100% of traffic here. I make an update. Um, again, now I'm, I'm tagging this revision with a, with a label called V1. So we can see again the revision list. 
we see here now the tag v1. And the next step is now I'm rolling out a second uh, version of my application, v2, and now make a traffic split directly to v1 and v2. For that, I can use again uh, K and service update. Update random minus minus image. So this is my my. So I jump to the top because I have some. One second. So see here. So you see here uh, the image. It's called uh, version 2.0. But then I say I make a traffic split, so I use minus minus traffic latest 50. This is always the, the latest deployed version, so in this case it's then version 2. It gets 50%, and then I have V1, which is also 50%. And then again, okay, this auto scale window, I can, I set again to a little bit higher, so I'm not sure why my outs has been broken. So I set it again to 60 seconds so that we can, it doesn't, that it's not so dynamic. Okay, so I'm using a 50-50% of course, and normally if you're in production you would use something like 90-10 or 10-90 so that you make kind of clear deployment so you roll out your new version and only set it to 10% of um, traffic so that you can try out stuff. And, uh, but for the sake of uh, demo I'm just using a 50-50 so that when I'm going now to the, again, I jump again to the top here, we're going to curl. Again, I see here, so let me use minus s. So, when we see a version one, next one, again version one, so, uh, but over the long run, again version one. Now we have version two, you see a version two. And so of course, if you have a large number of requests, then uh, the distribution will be around 50. One, two, A. So, and uh, as you said, you can really create a lot of very flexible rollout strategies. You could also do blue green deployment to say, okay, I'm I'm just firing up my new version. Um, so, and then you you switch over completely from 100% uh, to the new version after it's everything is up and you have tested it. Because also every revision you have has also an old URL, so you can test your revisions directly without going over the service. You see this, for example. So this is also my last service vision list. We have here again our, oops, it's a revision list. See here, for example, we have that one, and then I can say revision describe, random. You see here, oh, it's not shown here, but you can directly use, uh, let me try whether this works, but you can use here the name of your V1. Okay, no, but there's a new URL, so I, but I have to look up this uh, this again. Okay, let's go back to the slides, and this is also all of what I have about serving. So, um, yeah, I hope now I hand over to Matthias. Your show now. Tell us about right. eventing. Great. All right. Yeah, welcome to the second part of this um, Knative introduction. Um, Roland was covering the basis uh, of Knative serving, and in my eventing um, specific section here, I'm going to leverage some of that because I use Knative eventing to actually populate the services that were deployed as Knative serving services. So Knative eventing, as Roland was already saying, was uh, is one of the two biggest parts of Knative overall project. And to some degree, you can summarize the eventing project. You can see it as a universal cast subscription and event delivery and management of events. And very, very important here, it's all really based on cloud events, which is the public uh, digital standard from the CNCF. So everything that we will see and everything that we will do within Knative eventing is really based on a public standard um, called cloud events. Um, Knative eventing, um, as I was already saying, is based on cloud events. It's, it's really important to actually 
um, underline it again, that's based on an official standard, so that is also very important for interoperability with other systems. So, for instance, if your existing application is interested in emitting some events, let's say, to some part of Knative, you can just exchange it and have a vanilla HTTP call to the Knative components. Um, it is a very pluggable mechanism for the overall event delivery. It has the concept of a channel. There are different implementations available in the uh, Knative ecosystem. Um, the in-memory channel is kind of the toy that comes with Knative eventing as the default choice. However, you can also pick a channel implementation that's based on Apache Kafka. There's also alternatives um, that are leveraging messaging infrastructure from the Google PubSub project. Um, <clears throat> the the uh, specific routing from events uh, to a different thing is, is, is done through um, YAML configuration. And the really interesting part here for the integration with third-party systems is a source. So you can easily develop your own source where you can call into your own um, legacy system, for instance, or into your specific database or whatever kind of third-party system you have. You receive the events and then you emit them as cloud events to the Knative components like the syncs. And in our case, the sync is an addressable that is consuming cloud events. And in our specific cases here for the demos that I have later, um, they are all written as Knative services. However, you can also use vanilla Kubernetes uh, services, but they don't have the nice uh, auto scanning stuff that Roland was explaining before. However, you could, for instance, have a Kafka source that is emitting to a good old um, Kubernetes uh, service as well. Hey, Matthias, as, a, as an old Java guy, um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking JMS. Is there like a comparison to what I already know, like queues, topics? Is that how I should think about cloud events in general? Um, not specifically in that sense. Knative is more like a universal system for, like you could see it as your eventing mesh, like different components produce messages and deliver them to the system. And later on, I explain a concept that's called the Knative broker. And with the broker, you have some kind of trigger where you can do some kind of filtering based on the metadata of the cloud event. But I wouldn't not really compare it so much with um, technologies like, like JMS. JMS on the protocol side is proprietary. Every system uses their own protocol, so there's not that much great interoperability. But here, um, the, the protocol or the wire frames that are on the protocol side is HTTP and cloud events, so you have much more standardized approaches there. So you can't mix and match different JMS implementations. So if you use vendor one, you have to use vendor one's API. You cannot combine that. And here it's really through a real official standard, not, not the JCP standard as an API compliancy, if, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Channels and brokers, a little bit more advanced topic, um, really important for the actual integration, and that's the biggest exposure for Knative users is really we have a pool of different Knative event sources, and they allow you a, a nice way to actually integrate your third-party systems with Knative. So, for instance, you could write your uh, Java application using Quarkus, for instance, and call into your database receive those database events and turn them into cloud event objects, and then you emit them to the sync that is injected, which at the end of the day would be just an HTTP URL where your source would perform an HTTP post. Um, most of the like full-blown sources, they come with their own um, custom resource definitions, so they are very declarative when you create them, and some of them are actually uh, running through an operator, you can have different integration models there. Uh, you can have like either push or pull based. For instance, we have a Kafka source that I'm going to show you later, which like gets the message from the broker. But we also have um, in the Knative eventing um, ecosystem, we have a GitHub source. So the GitHub source is based on webhooks that basically inform your cluster source that there was some new traffic on a certain pull request. And the kind of requirement that all of these sources have is they basically convert the like third party or proprietary event format into uh, standardized cloud events. So it is uh, easy for consumption on different languages and different systems, et cetera. So you can have your Go-based uh, 
um, source which is delivering events as HTTP cloud events to a Java service that is doing the consumption. We have a few sources um, built into the Knative project. So as in Knative eventing, the main repository, we have a ping source, which is kind of really similar to what you could do with a, with a cron job. It has a schedule and we can send some messages that we will see later. There's an API server source, which is interesting because it turns the Kubernetes API server like platform events into cloud events. So you can basically receive whenever a support started or whatever. And there is a sync binding and a container source. The container source is a kind of meta approach that you can basically create your own, bring your own container and stick it into the official container source YAML. Uh, very similar with sync binding. It's a little bit more um, abstract there, but both are actually allowing you to bring your own kind of container and make that usable with predefined uh, types in Knative eventing so that you can have your Python, JavaScript, or Java source um, integrated as a kind of um, Knative eventing uh, source instead of writing a full-fledged uh, operator and CRDs and whatnot. And then there's a Knative uh, contribution repository. There's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, for instance, I mentioned the GitHub source already. I mentioned the Kafka source um, that we will see later in action. And there's also integrations using Apache Camel. We have a Camel source, so you can run all of your integrations with the DSL that you know from Apache Camel and can uh, deliver messages from Camel to any uh, service consumers there as well. Now, with um, <clears throat> Knative, we see three big areas of use cases. Let me start with the first most simple one. There is a one-by-one -one connection to a Knative source and one Knative service using as a sync here. So there's a direct connection. And this is actually the most simple way to get cloud events from a source to your application that is consuming these events. However, there is a one-by-one -one connection, like a direct connection from the source to the service that means there's a little bit of drawbacks here. So there's like no back pressure support or no active queuing support when the service is not available. Um, and only one service consume that event. So if you want to have two services that want to consume the event, you would have to kind of scale up. You need a second source and you need a second service. But again, this is the first way into Knative um, for consuming. And there's also no specific filtering here around like the sync that is tied to exactly one source is getting all of the events. And I have a little demo here for you. Let me jump over to my terminal. What I have prepared here already is um, <clears throat> oops, two um, files here in my folder. One is a um, event display, which is a Knative serving service. Let me just quickly show you what the YAML looks like. So it's API service uh, for serving. Is a kind of serving. I have it in name. It's a display, and I bring my image here. It's KIO, uh, Matsu W, and then event display. So this is my, in our case, Go application that is receiving all events. Now this thing is already deployed, um, but there is no traffic to that particular uh, Knative serving service, so it's not yet scaled up. Um, however, let me show you what a ping source would be looking like. So ping source has the API version here, um, sources, Knative, dev, and then v1 alpha one, and it's a kind of the ping source. And here we have a name, it's the test ping source in our case. And what's really important here is inside of the spec object, we have that schedule. So every, every minute we get some data here, like hello Red Hat developer, and then all of the events that are created from the source are emitted to a sync, and we use a destination here for my ping display, which is a Knative serving service. Let me apply the file, and what we will see is that hopefully a pod is starting up. It is starting up. So this is basically the ping source that I was naming <clears throat> test ping source. And we see here the container is being created. And then soon, once the container is up and running, the ping source itself is um, working based on the schedule that we were having there. Like every minute there is one message. So now we have to wait a little bit here 
and whenever the ping source is actually creating based on schedule and the payload, so whenever it is creating it, it is emitting it to my already deployed service. And then the Knative serving activator goes in and fires up a Knative serving port for me. And then eventually when that thing is there, the message is distributed to our what we see here. Um, we can now take a look at the lock when the container has been started and is fully created. So we should see a message that says, hello Red Hat developers on the lock console. Let me read that right here. I need a log. Um, I provide the full name of the pod. And then as you can see, oops, there is two containers and we are interested in the user container here. So what we see is here a little bit of emoji. Um, I print out the entire payload of my cloud event here. So it has some specification uh, version. It has some type. So the type of the source is a ping source. I have like the source where it actually came from the event, like the event source source um, is my namespace default here, ping source, etc. It has an ID, it has a timestamp, and it has data content. And then in cloud events, it's specified that all of the data comes inside of the data body there. So every minute there is an event. And now I was talking over a minute, we see the second event here. Again, it says it is a valid cloud event. It has some nice emoji on there in my logger. That's pretty much um, the first hello world kind of experience with Knative eventing. <clears throat> so the next um, step is a little bit more flexible. So the source to service delivery is now done through the concept of a channel, which is basically an abstract uh, mechanism for um, yeah, receiving data and then delivering data, but on different principles here. So multiple services can basically uh, consume the same event with this one, and it's done through a subscription. What we see here on my slide deck on the left side is I have now two sources that are both emitting their events to the same channel, like one channel object, but now I have two subscriptions. So my first service here is receiving all of the messages, and the second one is receiving the same type of the messages. So this is a little bit more flexible. I have also the opportunity to bring in a different channel. I don't need to use the default choice of the memory channel. I can go with an Apache Kafka channel. So if you deploy the channel behind the scenes, the controller for the Kafka channel is creating a specific topic uh, with a specific setup like replication factors and participants as specify them when you set it up. And, but that's all taken care of for you. So you submit messages to the channel. And then with the subscription, each subscriber gets the same messages. So there's still a little bit of drawbacks there. It has some kind of infrastructure needs because, as I said, if you're going with a Kafka, you have to have a Kafka running somewhere. And still, there is no filtering because every subscribed service is basically receiving all of the event. And uh, the last more universal is really the source and service delivery through a broker and a trigger. And this is really a nice way to see all of the benefits from Knative eventing. Basically, you use the Knative broker as your eventing mesh for distributing all of the um, events in, in your specific namespace here. What we see here is I have a green source and I have a yellow source and I have a few events emitted to the same broker, the Knative broker. And then I have not really a subscription as I had before. It uses subscribers behind the scenes. But this is a trigger that I have deployed here. So the first trigger says, hey, little broker, I'm interested in all of the yellow events. So this service is not getting every event on the broker. It's only getting the yellow event. And the trigger here for my second service is saying, hey, I'm only interested in this greenish event. So he's also just getting the green one. So three events go into the broker, one is going to my second service, and two of them are going to my first service. So I have a fine-grained way to actually trigger uh, event delivery based on attributes of the cloud events. So I was using the type filter here, so I said the type is a yellow event and the type is a green event. So I have some kind of content-based routing for my services here. Mm. 
A little bit recap on the concept. So the broker is really the universal delivery system, or I, I really like to call it the eventing mesh. And it does connect sources uh, with different things. And behind the scenes, it is using um, the channel um, implementation. And it is creating it all on the fly just for the user. There's like, if you use the vanilla configuration, there's no setup needed. With the latest release, we also have the opportunity to use a multi-tenant broker option so that there is a broker running in a global Canadian eventing namespace and not in your user namespace where the program is. And then the trigger is really the driver and the routing component here. So it filters events based on the type or based on the source. So if you have a few different sources providing all of the same cloud event type, you can filter, I want it just from source A or just from source B with the type of blah, blah, blah. Um, you can also easily, as I was saying earlier on, with your existing um, applications, you can deliver messages direct to the broker and feed it in there. And then the trigger also would still apply to everything that's available on the broker. And the trigger can also basically produce new events and return them like as a reply to the broker and all of that. And that again is very, very important. It's all done through uh, standardized cloud event objects. So there's like really big interoperability with uh, multiple um, vendors and multiple programs as possible here. Matthias, maybe, I have, I, maybe I've, I have a stupid question, but maybe it's not. So you're talking broker, right? So what is a broker and is that part of Knative or? Yeah, the Knative broker is, is really the eventing mesh. That is the that is the thing that is distributing all of the events based on the trigger. It's not really related to a broker in the sense of the messaging brokers that you may be confused with. However, the broker uses a channel underneath the scenes for uh, the distribution of all of the messages. So if you say, I want to have a Knative broker, it gives you an object of the broker in a per namespace, and behind the scenes, it is using whatever is the default setup for the channels. And the channels are, are those that actually manifested the transport behind the scenes. So the broker really here is just the delivery mechanism, and it is running all of the triggers to actually perform the content-based routing. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. But I can show you an action as well. I have one more demo here for you guys. Let me jump to the terminal. OK. So um, I have prepared something here um, that has a little bit more complexity. I was Before the demo, I was already installing two different Knative serving services, one that is called Kafka Broker Display and one is called Ping Broker Display. They will be eventually used for consuming all of the message. And uh, in order to instantiate my broker, I would have to label the namespace. So I'm going to use my default namespace here and I provided a label called Knative Eventing Injection Enabled. And now what you see is two more pods will come up. One, <clears throat> so two more pods will come up for the broker. One is actually the ingress of the broker and the other one is for the filter of the broker. Um, and those two pods in combination are basically the, the broker that I'm going to use here. Now, the services, they are already applied, so they are already actively running in my namespace, but since there was no message delivered by the broker slash trigger to either of these of um, serving services, none of them are now running. Now, let me um, take a look at the different sources that I'm using here that are emitting their events now to a broker instead of to a directly tied and coupled service here. Let's start with the Kafka source. Um, the Kafka source is in the same API version group here. It is sources Knative Dev, and it has a kind of Kafka source. Here I give it a name. And then inside of the specification, that's what really interesting here is I gave it a, cons I gave it a, a consumer group. In my case, I'm using demo. And here I'm using the uh, cluster that I have installed locally on my OpenShift instance here. I'm using Strimzy um, or uh, Red Hat AMQ Streams here. 
um, it's running in the Kafka namespace and my bootstrap server that's the default setup from the Strimzy project is this URL and I'm having uh, a topic so this source is listening to one topic in our case topic is called my topic now the important difference here between the previous um, definitions is that the sync is now no longer a Knative serving service it is the broker and it is the default broker. and what we see here is the part that I was labeled, uh, creating here based on my labeling is actually that different default broker running in my namespace. So all of the events that are coming from the topic to the, to the source here, to the Kafka source, are being transformed or being um, distributed broker and later on for consumption. Let me apply my Kafka source here. And <clears throat> I made a change to the ping source. So again, here we have the test ping source. There's no modification in terms of the payload. However, when I apply it, I basically reconfigure the currently running ping source and I will have the events from that source going to my broker now instead of the Knative serving service. So the ping display will eventually go away because it will no longer receive any um, message because the reconfigured version of the ping source is going to omit all of its events, like every minute one message, to the broker. Let me apply that file as well. What we see here is <clears throat> it doesn't say created because I just changed it. And here we see a new pod is coming up now that is representing the latest configuration. And when this specific pod is actually running, we will see the old guy will be terminated. And then this instance is no longer emitting the events display here, and that will go away. Okay, so what we have here is we have two sources configured to emit events to the broker. However, we are not yet consuming them. So this is where all of the magic comes in. And the broker is really just a black box concept. Uh, the user usually doesn't have to deal with it that much. It's more um, an interoperability through the triggers. Now let me see the triggers for some event filtering here. So for instance, how can I filter events from my Kafka source? So this is basically the API that users are uh, mostly interacting with. So there is a kind trigger that's in the evading namespace. And <clears throat> um, what is interesting here inside of the specification, I say I want to listen on the default broker and I want to apply a few filtering rules. So I have a filter based on cloud event attributes. And every cloud event does need a attribute called type. And in our case, with the Knative Kafka source, the event type for all of the Kafka events are actually dev Knative Kafka event. And then it is basically delivering the events to the interested subscriber, which in our case is a Knative serving service called Kafka Broker. Let me apply this trigger. All right, and now let's take a look at the other trigger that I have in here. So what you see already here is um, above in the schedule with the pod. I was talking a little bit longer here and I have already prepared a lot of um, um, dumping messages to my Kafka object, to, sorry, to my Kafka topic. So there's a lot of messages already in that topic. and based on the scaling facility that Roland was explaining. Now Knative sees there is messages delivered from uh, the broker to the different Kafka display here. So it's creating a lot of different pods there, right? So Knative, the autoscaler is basically, um, yeah, ensuring that there is a lot of um, instances of my Knative serving available so that they all can receive messages there. Let me take a quick look here. Oops what the logs would be looking like. Go in here. So <clears throat> in the background I have prepared a uh, application that is basically um, receiving WebSocket events from the University of Newcastle 
and is uh, turning these uh, WebSocket events is turning them into um, Kafka objects. Uh, sorry, into Kafka messages. And my cloud events uh, that I see here is basically the transformation from the from the Knative um, source for the Kafka source. So um, again, I have some emoji here in my display. It is a valid cloud event, um, and it has some context here. Here's a different type. A native Kafka event and you see already it's catching up with the messages so similar to the uh, example from Roland before when there is a more um, um, when there is less traffic it will basically um, reduce the number of active deployments but here it, it has uh, some cloud event values here so again specification version for cloud events is 1.0 it has a source like the origin um, it comes uh, so the events here come from my default namespace and come from the Kafka source, which has a name and which is bound to a specific topic. It has some subject that is an attribute specified in the cloud event specification. In our case, we see this is message number 719 on partition number um, number uh, 57. Um, <clears throat> we use some uh, cloud event extensions are we using here. Um, so basically the message was hopping through different channels as the broker mechanism was playing with it. So we see here that there's a Knative history. So it came through a trigger based channel before it was actually delivered to my service. And then here I see some data that is just some JSON data, which is basically the exact payload that I would receive from the uh, WebSocket service that my background application is hammering data to. Okay, I have a second trigger. Um, okay. That I'm applying now, and I can walk you through this as well. <clears throat> so what I have here is I have a different filter. I'm basically saying I'm only interested in events that are ping, like Knative, the def Knative sources ping, and then uh, it is routing these events to a different service. So let me apply that. I have already applied that, and I guess I have too much messages here. Um, <laughs> and and not enough course, time left, so. <laughs> <laughs> let me just quickly see if I get a pot there, but. Uh, I think I was having too much messages. Ah, here. Okay. So we have one instance here of the broker ping display. Let me just quickly show that to you as well. And then I, oops, docs minus F. And then you can see that actually this guy is only having the, the messages for the ping source. Yeah. There's no Kafka message in there. Um, we have seen this before some in the context as well. Now it went through the broker. So we see the extensions. That's the difference to my first example with the ping source. So we see as well how it was transferring through the cluster. It says it came from the uh, channel behind the broker. And there is some time of arrival when that actually uh, was delivered, etc. And there's some tracing uh, information here now as well. Um, yeah. So this was the filter for the ping message. And the other one was the filter for the Kafka messages. And um, that basically was my demo. A little bit more. Um, there's a few more types. There is the event registry, um, which is about discoverability of events. You can specify them on the sources and through event type so that you can actually have the developer know what kind of events are available for me to consume. And there are some more concepts that allow you to basically have some chaining of different services or branching events with different filters. That's called parallel. And the other one is called a sequence. And um, that's probably it with the full